Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is staying safe uh, during these most challenging of times. We at the Washington Institute are trying to bring the Middle East uh, right to your home uh, as we all face uh, this COVID uh, situation. Uh, we are focusing today on the topic of Palestinian succession. And it's a topic that has, um, you know, talked about a lot outside the West Bank for years, and now is talked about, I think, fairly freely in the West Bank itself. After all, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is 85 years old, some say even older. He's smoked uh, two packs a day for many years. And uh, at this time, where tomorrow is supposed to be July 1st about West Bank annexation, it is brought also into focus the whole question of the future of the Palestinian Authority and who could succeed uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Polling data suggests that people have a differing views on that. Uh, we're really delighted to be joined with really three who I consider the world-class experts on the Palestinian issue. Uh, and I'm proud to call them colleagues of mine. One is Raith al -Omari. He's a senior fellow at the Washington Institute in the Irwin Levy Family Program. He's the former executive director of the American Task Force on Palestine. He served as an advisor to the Palestinian Authority uh, in the early part of, of late 90s and early 2000s, was at the Camp David uh, Summit, and he's someone who's a really uh, premier Palestinian watcher. Ehud Yari is also someone well-known uh, to our audience for decades. He is the Israel-based Lafer International Fellow at the Washington Institute. He's a, the premier Middle East commentator in Israel, uh, working for Channel 2, now called Channel 12, a former associate editor of the Jerusalem Report. Ehud has been a Middle East commentator since 1975. And is for Israel TV, he's written eight books on the Arab-Israel conflict. Mike Herzog uh, is also someone known to our audience, follows Palestinian affairs closely. And he's a retired brigadier general of the Israeli Defense Forces. He's the Israel-based Milton Fine uh, International Fellow of the Washington Institute. Uh, over the last decade, uh, before joining the, the Washington Institute, uh, Mike Herzog has held senior positions uh, in the Israeli Minister of Defense, has been the Chief of Staff or Military Secretary for four Israeli Defense Ministers in a row, and has been at many of the key juncture points of uh, U.S.-Israel and Israeli-Palestinian relations. So I'm delighted that they'll be joining us. I think you're all in for a treat and a very rich discussion. And we'll kick it off with Ray. All right, thank you very much, David, and uh, good morning to everyone. I would focus, try to focus in my 10 minutes on uh, the, some of the institutional and structural uh, dynamics that will impact uh, uh, succession and how and what are some of the risks and policy implications for that. So uh, I would start by saying that uh, today we actually have no idea who the successor is going to be. And that is not a coincidence. This is a result of a very deliberate, very intentional policy by Abbas. Every time someone emerges uh, as someone with a base or a potential successor, Abbas puts them down, pushes them aside. And for Abbas, this, this makes uh, sense. Uh, um, it eliminates any competitors, uh, any uh, comp competing power centers, but it also worked for him internationally in that uh, often you find international actors unwilling to push him too hard because uh, there's a sense that if he gets pushed too hard, he would leave and there's no successor. So all of these things have worked uh, to create a pattern now where uh, Abbas has intentionally made sure that no one is emerging as a clear competitors and is uh, playing, let's say, a game with the different aspirants of pitting them against one another. The one thing that we do know, though, that uh, uh, if Abbas were to depart the scene in the foreseeable future, the constitutionally mandated uh, process of succession will not take place. The Palestinian Basic Law, well, that's the Palestinian Constitution, mandates that if the president uh, departs, then the Speaker of Parliament becomes president for uh, two months, after which elections uh, uh, are held. Today, this is um, unimaginable. It's unimaginable because uh, the Speaker of Parliament is a Hamas member. It's unimaginable because Abbas, in anticipation of this, uh, dissolved uh, the uh, PLC, I believe, in 2018. 
and it's unimaginable because uh, elections today in the current Palestinian reality are simply uh, not a realistic option. In reality, probably what will happen if there's succession is that you will have Fatah, that's the uh, leading uh, party controlling the Palestinian Authority, decide among one of theirs as a, as a Palestinian, as a, as a presidential candidate, uh, the Fatah Central Committee, that's the highest uh, decision-making body in the movement, will decide, will pick one of its members, most likely the weakest and least ambitious uh, of them all, uh, as uh, the next president. The PLO will confirm this uh, leader and uh, the, Palest the Constitutional Court, the PA Constitutional Court, which was established by Abbas uh, in 2016, will then ratify uh, this decision. The problem is that each of these three institutions, Fatah, the PLO, and the PA, today are facing extremely uh, deep crises, each of its own. If you look at Fatah, Fatah used to be the, uh, a very vibrant uh, political movement that uh, you know, uh, included a vast majority of the Palestinian public. This is no longer the case. It's no longer the case because there's another organization competing against it, that's Hamas. It's not the case because uh, Fatah as well has become uh, too bureaucratized, too enmeshed in the uh, Palestinian Authority, and therefore is uh, repelling many of the young uh, Palestinian activists and frankly its overall uh, uh, message of a two-state solution via diplomacy has also lost a lot of credibility. And so today, Fatah is no longer the vibrant organization it used to be. And Abbas, to ensure the loyalty of uh, the Fatah cadre in the last Fatah uh, conference, has basically pushed out anyone who disagrees with him. So today you have a smaller Fatah that, well, that is loyal, but without the kind of uh, uh, public support base that it once had. And even within Fatah Central Committee itself, uh, while it is composed of people who are not, who are best picked not to be uh, people who will push against him, who will be uh, 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 you know, non-pliant, yet within that committee itself, there are many uh, tensions and many factions, ever-changing factions. We saw maybe an aperitif of this, uh, uh, recently, when Fatah was asked to choose a prime minister, it took the Central Committee more than five weeks to pick one among themselves, um, and it was an extremely fraught uh, process. We expect something as fraught to take uh, place um, if there is a presidential succession, and today we simply do not see the Fatah Central Committee acting as one unit, nor do we see Fatah itself uh, acting as uh, one strong movement. Um, the PLO has been uh, steadily being marginalized, certainly since the creation of the Palestinian Authority. This marginalization uh, uh, accelerated uh, during uh, Abbas's reign. Uh, many of the kind of authorities that Arafat ceded to the PLO even uh, during his time in Ramallah and Gaza, um, uh, basically Abbas took away. And the add, of course, of the generational change that we see in the Palestinian uh, public. Most of the Palestinians today are young and do not remember the heydays of the PLO. So the PLO's um, basic legitimacy and ability to be a legitimizer has been uh, compromised. And the Palestinian Authority itself has been going through a long uh, compound crisis uh, at a very fundamental level. Its message of uh, independence via uh, diplomacy has basically lost traction after the failure of uh, successive uh, uh, peace uh, negotiation rounds uh, and uh, the uh, annexation might come as a coup de grace when it comes to uh, its own legitimacy. Uh, add to that, of course, the division within the Palestinian uh, public. Add to that the failure of the Palestinian Authority to govern and the sense that it's corrupt, which is a prevailing sense among the Palestinian public. Overlay that with a deep economic crisis impacted both by uh, COVID, where the initial performance of the PA was uh, widely supported by the public, but that initial rally around the flag moment is now receding, and the economic problem caused by the PA's decision to stop receiving uh, um, payments from Israel, VAT transfers from Israel, all of this uh, adds to a PA that is going through a crisis and a public that simply has very little faith uh, in the uh, PA. And of course, ultimately, if the PA were to uh, choose a non-constitutional way of choosing its own leader, then uh, uh, that will further add to its lack of uh, legitimacy. So if you look at the scenarios uh, for succession, the most likely scenario in my view is that, uh, as I mentioned before, Fatah leaders will come 
will choose one of them. As I said, probably they will choose the weakest, oldest, least uh, ambitious and least threatening person. Use that person, use him, because there are no women who are competing. As basically a front while the power competition uh, continues behind the, the scenes. This leader will probably, or the Fatah Central Committee will try to curtail the powers of this leader, uh, as they did with the prime minister. Uh, but there is another scenario that is being floated, and that's a scenario of a three-leader scenario, because both Arafat and Abbas are not only presidents of the Palestinian Authority, they are chairman of the uh, PLO and uh, leaders of uh, Fatah. So it's been discussed that, or it's been proposed that uh, the next, we'll not have the next Palestinian leader, but we're going to have three leaders, each of them uh, heading one of these uh, organizations. That is a possibility. And if you talk to uh, presidential aspirants today, most of them will tell you that this is their preference. I doubt it. I doubt it because uh, the three institutions are too interdependent. Uh, the leader of the PA will have access to budgets and to security forces will make him very powerful. The leader of Fatah will have access to uh, structures that will give him a lot of power within the PA itself, since Fatah members are the majority of the PA uh, sir, public sir, uh, civil servants. Um, and the PLO, while the least important, now that the idea of a PA collapse is uh, being considered, not as a likelihood, as a, you know, as a likelihood, but as a possibility, uh, it remains an attractive position. So my own thinking on this is that most likely, um, once the succession starts, the default position will be for one of the leaders to try to push uh, uh, himself to be the leaders of all three, but uh, there is a possibility that they might revert uh, to this. The real question, uh, one of the key questions at least uh, that relate to succession is will it be uh, prolonged or will it be a quick succession process? Uh, it's worth noting that when Arafat died, it took the PLO more th uh, less than two hours to decide on his successor and that helped Abbas quickly consolidate and uh, uh, nip any attempts uh, by others to challenge him in the bud. Uh, the longer the succession takes, uh, takes, the more likely that destabilization uh, might result. Succession, of course, is, is you know, particularly such an uncertain succession, comes with many risks. Um, today, we're seeing one of the risks. There is complete paralysis uh, today. No leader wants to take uh, forward-leaning positions because when you're competing for succession, you don't compete by being soft. You compete by being uh, hardline. Hamas will definitely try to use uh, succession for its own purposes. I doubt that Hamas will try to run a president. Um, there is a debate within Hamas, and we can talk about this uh, more later. But Hamas will use the instability to try to create uh, 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 unrest in the uh, West Bank. Um, there might be instability and there are major questions. Will the Palestinian security forces continue to operate? Who will they respond to? Will they operate as a unit? Will they fracture? Um, and at, um, at a worst case scenario, given all of the weakness of the PA, the uh, prolonged uncertain succession could be the uh, proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Annexation is adding to this instability. And uh, in a context of annexation, it is forcing all of the uh, contenders to take very hard line positions. We see this uh, in the statements of the prime minister and other uh, aspirants. I would conclude by maybe a couple of points of what can the US do. Uh, there's not much that the US can do directly. Um, we've never been particularly good in managing other people's politics. And given the fact that there is no communication now between the PA and uh, the U.S. The U.S. has very few direct uh, tools, and if there is a way for the U.S. to impact this process, it will be through working with its uh, Arab allies. Uh, here, in particular, the most well-placed country to impact this process is Jordan, but Jordan uh, will not uh, play this role without uh, uh, very strong Arab backing and will not trust the Arab backing unless this Arab backing is guaranteed by the US, uh, and which is a matter of question giving, you know, the lack of clarity in the US regional policy uh, today. Um, and Jordan or no Arab country will want to, mess the, to meddle too much uh, with Palestinian politics in the context of annexation. No Arab leader wants to be accused of trying to uh, undermine the Palestinian leader at a time of annexation. Um, the most that the U.S. could do right now, and I would say the international community, is uh, 
at the very least, to try to push for policies that will lead to more stability on the ground. Uh, succession will inject an additional element of instability. There is, of course, no inevitability that it will lead to uh, unrest, but it will add another uh, uh, variable to an already overcrowded uh, equation. And the best that we can do right now is to try to uh, uh, eliminate some of these sources of instability. That includes, to my mind, uh, pulling back from the annexation push. It will include adopting policies that will move away from uh, uh, you know, big aspirational peace processes to a more uh, practical, concrete steps that will uh, focus on economy, security, and small steps that can rebuild trust between Palestinians and Israelis. With this, I will conclude and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wraith. Uh, Wraith is joining us from Washington, and now we're going to go over to Israel to hear from Ehud Yari. Ehud, over to you. Yeah, thank you, David. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Wraith. Uh, I'll be blunt as usual. Uh, number one, we have to remember that uh, Mr. Abbas's uh, late father died at an age well over 100, healthy. From the point of view of Mr. Abbas, to the best of my understanding and experience, he's a mid-career politician at this point. He's not going anywhere. It's very important, important to keep in mind this uh, 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 frame of mind of uh, Mr. Abbas. The second point, we have to realize that the Palestinian Authority is, uh, to put it mildly, halfway on the way to uh, complete bankruptcy. Even if they change their mind and uh, are prepared to accept the 500 million shekels that Mr. Netanyahu has promised to transfer to them uh, every second of the month, I think the date is. Uh, and the third point is that when we watch them, and which I do as much as I can very closely, getting ready, ready for a possible uh, annexation move by Israel backed by the Trump administration. What you see in Ramallah, what you see in the Fatah Central Community, co Committee, at the top uh, echelon of uh, the PLO, uh, what you see is total confusion. And I would venture to say at this, this point, they have no idea what exactly they are going to do if there is a move for annexation. In brackets, uh, I don't think annexation, if it comes, uh, will be a big bang or a game changer. I think the Palestinian leadership is already assured that there will be no annexation of the Jordan Valley, maybe two, maybe three of the settlement blocks, which basically were agreed upon in previous uh, uh, negotiations. So, so far, they are quarreling amongst themselves the leadership of uh, Fatah and the uh, PA, and they cannot settle on a course of action. I'll give you an example. Uh, Mr. Abbas has instructed his prime minister, Mr. Mohammed Shtaye, who gained some popularity in the polls and in the street uh, for his handling of the uh, 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 coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, he has instructed him not to deal and not to refer and not to say anything about the political issues, especially about the annexation. Take care of the services to the population. That was the message. The next point would be that Mr. Steyer is apparently, at least partly, disregarding this piece of advice he got from Mr. Abbas. And I think it is tomorrow that he's going to have a briefing with some uh, forum uh, in Washington. That again, that's against the explicit instructions of his uh, uh, boss. I'll come to him in a second. I think there are two decisions that were taken so far by the Palestinian leadership. One is contrary to what they were contemplating in the past, 
they are not going to announce, in case of a move for annexation, they are not going to announce the dissolution of the PA and handing over the keys uh, to Israel. That's not going to happen. What they are talking now is probably an extended process in which bit by bit over many, many months, Israel will be required to take care of this and take care of that. And then it's up to Israel to decide what it does. The second decision, which I find very important that they have taken quietly, all important decisions are taken quietly, not in front of the microphones, is not to declare again the birth of a Palestinian state and seek to win now recognition that here is a state with its uh, uh, territories uh, occupied by the uh, move of, of annexation. Um, these are the two decisions. The rest is still up in the air, depends whether A, we have annexation uh, and what extent of annexation. Contrary to what the, uh, the official position of the PA is, that we are not discussing with the United States and of course not talking to Israel, which of course doesn't really take place, uh, they are employing uh, messengers, uh, not people from the upper echelon of the PA or the Fatah, to converse with the US with the Trump administration. One is Mr. Samir El Khouri, the boss of the Triple C company in Athens. Long, long, long partners for decades of Fatah, PLO, Arafat, managing important funds for the whole structure. So they are employing now Samir El and they are employing a banker, Mr. Hashem Hashawa, a family originally from Gaza, who is heading the Bank of uh, Palestine. I don't remember exactly whether he's the president now or the CEO, but these are people with good contacts and they are employed in order to talk to the Americans and see whether there can be some formula to delay, defer, prevent annexation. Um, now about the succession. Uh, I think we have a very clear picture uh, of uh, uh, how uh, it's shaping up. On the one hand, you have a powerful coalition uh, of people who are generally up to a point, of course, trusted by Mr. Abbas, uh, led by the head of the uh, security forces, uh, General Majid Faraj, and his partner, the Minister for Civilian Affairs, Mr. Hussein Sheikh, who is actually the guy in charge of all relations with Israel. So the two guys who manage all relations with Israel, whether it's in the civilian domain or the security and intelligence uh, domain, they are heading this coalition. They were the ones who promoted Mr. Steyer to become prime minister. It doesn't mean that their support is necessarily going to be a lasting one. Uh, and they control the public sector, the different security uh, agencies, etc. For example, when Mr. Abbas wanted to have a few days ago a big rally against the idea of annexation uh, in Jericho, it was the members of the security uh, services and uh, state employees who were bused to Jericho to participate in a rally because they couldn't get the public there. The public wouldn't show up. And the, the Palestinian street you can see it in the polls, you can see it when you talk to people, it's not about that right now. And by the way, Abbas is very furious with some of his lieutenants for being unable to mobilize uh, uh, the street. Against this coalition, 
led by Faraj and uh, Hussein Asher, uh, is a rival coalition, which is led by uh, Jibril uh, Rajoub, the ex-head uh, uh, of the preventive security, uh, now in charge of preparations for the annexation and heading the Palestinian Olympic Committee and Football Association, which is very uh, important. Jibril has a, a strong support in the uh, Hebron Mountain uh, region. Uh, and he's uh, uh, allied with the ex-head of uh, uh, general intelligence, uh, Taufik Tirawi, a man who is publicly very critical of Abbas and PA uh, policies. Mr. Tirawi has some support amongst Tanzim, that is Fatah Yus, uh, generally lightly armed in the refugee camps, some of the villages, some of the suburbs. Their candidate at this point to replace uh, uh, Abbas is the nephew of Mr. Arafat, Mr. Nasr al Kidwe. Uh, who had several stints as in top positions for the UN. Um, Kidwa doesn't have a very high profile these days. He's heading the Arafat Foundation. Um, that's their candidate. What is uh, interesting about the election, that they are maintaining contacts and probably some uh, temporary understandings with uh, Mr. Mohammed Dahlan, chief of the preventive security in Gaza. In fact, the guy responsible for losing, losing Gaza to Hamas in 2007. He's based in Abu Dhabi, although he spends time in Montenegro and even more so Serbia. He became a citizen there. Uh, and he brings some dowry to this uh, coalition uh, in, in Gaza, a little uh, in the West Bank, etc. In between these two rival coalitions fighting or maneuvering for succession whenever it takes place, you have figures, I will not mention everybody, I'll mention one. You have figures like Mahmoud El Alul, who was appointed uh, in the last Fatah Congress by Abbas to be the number two in the leadership of the Fatah movement. Uh, everybody in the uh, uh, leadership circles in Ramallah uh, feels that Alul is not up to it. He's a guy who's coming from the depths uh, of the terrorist branches of the PLO in the old days, what was called the Western sector. Uh, and he's not sophisticated and doesn't speak languages, etc., etc., etc. But Alul, uh, who has following in, especially in the Nablus uh, area, he also served as governor there, is trying to posi position himself as a compromise between the two rival coalitions. As Ray uh, said, I don't know how it will shape out when the moment comes because I don't know whether the cohesion of the security services will be maintained. And as some of my good friends uh, uh, in Fatah uh, are saying, and I'm just quoting, they are saying, we are all Italian thieves. We make deals in the morning and uh, 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 betray our allies uh, at night. Nobody is very trusting uh, of nobody in that leadership. So it's a shifting sense. I'll stop here. Thank you, Ehud. Now over also to someone in Israel is, is Mike Kurtzak. Mike, over to you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, good afternoon here in Israel. Good morning in America. I'll speak about the topic uh, from an Israeli perspective. Uh, and let me start by observing that uh, uh, this topic of uh, Palestinian succession 
uh, doesn't really occupy uh, decision makers uh, in Israel. They don't think much about it, they don't talk about it. I'm unaware of uh, major policy debates about this uh, issue. Um, and uh, it has not come up uh, as a consideration in the debate here in Israel about the uh, application of sovereignty in the West Bank. Nobody mentioned that, uh, how that might affect a future Palestinian leadership. Uh, I must say that uh, also in the US, uh, in the administration, I didn't find much uh, resonance of uh, this topic. People don't really think about it. And in my conversation with the uh, people in the administration, they don't know many of the candidates that we uh, talk about and know very well. I don't think they invested any time or effort in order to uh, you know, know and gain uh, knowledge about these guys and not to speak about uh, some engagement uh, with them. However, however, at the uh, professional level here in Israel, in the defense establishment, uh, people do follow this issue and I've had the opportunity to uh, talk to people who deal with it and I will share some uh, thoughts and the themes that I, I heard <coughs> in these talks. Obviously, the consequences of Palestinian succession depend on when exactly and under what circumstances this is going to happen, how exactly it is going to, uh, to occur, will it be uh, sudden, will it be a, a, you know, a managed transition or something else. Uh, as Eod mentioned correctly, Abu Mazen often uh, reminds us that his father lived to age 103, uh, but that doesn't mean much because uh, <clears throat> he could depart us any day. Our Prime Minister Ariel Sharon used to brag about his uh, ancestors living to a very high age and then he collapsed at uh, not such a high age. So we have to prepare as if it's going to happen uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> Obviously, this is going to be a major event because Abu Mazen uh, was the last of the, this uh, generation of the founding fathers of the Fatah movement, of the PLO and of the... Uh, Palestinian authority, so uh, whoever uh, steps into his shoes, it's going to be uh, quite a different uh, ball game. Here in Israel, uh, we know very well uh, all the candidates. We know them from intelligence files, from talking to them, from negotiating with them, and uh, some of them spent a long time in our jail, so they, they are not unknowns. We know exactly who they are. And when you talk to people uh, in the defense establishment about this, uh, uh, you hear uh, several recurring themes which I would like to, to share with you. First, it's clear that whoever succeeds Abu Mazen is going to inherit a very, very challenging environment, very challenging uh, reality. The PA is a very weak uh, entity, weak politically, weak uh, economically. As I would mention, it's uh, on the verge of economic collapse. <clears throat> it is a corrupt entity divided between the West Bank, Bank and Gaza. Uh, the Fatah movement, the, the mainstream you know, body politic of, um, of the Palestinian society is in a deep crisis. Uh, there's an ongoing rift with Hamas and Gaza which is becoming more and more permanent. It's now 13 years since, since Hamas took over, and uh, nobody sees a way out to get rid of Hamas in Gaza. It's not going to happen through uh, people rising against them, or reconciliation, or elections, or an uh, Israeli military operation. So they are there. And uh, when it comes to relations with Israel, uh, the, the two parties are uh, moving uh, far apart and the majority in both societies uh, does not see a real chance in the foreseeable future for a breakthrough to an agreed solution or to a two-state uh, solution. And in Israel, <coughs> with time, the paradigm of thinking about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is also uh, changing, as you can see today. I mean, uh, uh, annexation was never a mainstream policy issue in, here in Israel. Suddenly it is. And uh, the question is, uh, you know, when and how, less a question of if at all. 
Now, <clears throat> from an Israeli point of view, given uh, these dire circumstances which any future Palestinian leader is going to inherit, uh, people think that there's no one candidate that can shoulder this burden on his own. It's more likely uh, that you will need uh, some kind of a collective leadership or some people coming together. Uh, Eud mentioned the two major coalition. Indeed, that's the picture you see uh, here, sitting here in Israel. Um, the people I spoke to believe that uh, there would be bet better chances for succession and then coping with the challenges to a coalition uh, that uh, includes Dahlan Tirawi, if they manage to mend fences with uh, Muhammad Dahlan. And if, additionally, they manage to bring along a capable executive like uh, Salam Fayyad, for example, so that will combine uh, capabilities to manage things on the ground with the executive capabilities and a veneer of international respectability, uh, the ability to better converse with Hamas and also bring some Arab uh, actors uh, along, as Dahlan might do. Uh, in any case, uh, there, there is concern in Israel that uh, if succession, uh, if Abu Mazen stepped down uh, in a very sudden manner, that Hamas will uh, try and fill uh, the void, as it has done after uh, Yasser Arafat, Abu Ammar, uh, stepped down in 2004. And then uh, even though Abu Mazen was elected, Hamas won Parliamentary, uh, parliamentary elections, and there is feeling that Hamas will go for some kind of a leadership role in the Palestinian national movement, uh, even if they don't uh, run for presidency I, don't, uh, presidency, I don't know what the, the decision uh, will be. Uh, but if Hamas tries to make a move in West Bank, I think uh, there is a chance that uh, Israel uh, will uh, intervene. Uh, whoever succeeds Abu Mazen, I think the, the basic assumption here in Israel, be it one person or a coalition uh, or a collective leadership, will probably have to uh, take a very harsh, strong position against Israel to, con to consolidate his, their uh, grip on power. And even more so uh, if he steps in in a reality where Israel uh, has annexed uh, parts of uh, the West Bank. You will have to campaign against it. You will have to campaign uh, against the Trump plan. Uh, that's, uh, I, I would say, the basic assumption governing the thinking of uh, people in Israel who deal with it and who think about it. And people also take into consideration that uh, this uh, <clears throat> competition for power the day after Abu Mazen might even uh, turn uh, violent. People on the ground are collecting weapons. Uh, there are Tanzim people with weapons, and some of them interact with security forces. Tirawi is collecting weapons, and uh, at one point this was, it could also uh, erupt uh, violently. <clears throat> uh, to sum up, in terms of uh, you know thinking about this in policy terms, I would like to make three points. The first point is I believe that uh, decision makers, both here in Israel and in the United States, should start thinking about the day after. Again, we don't know how long Abu Mazen will be there, but it's time to follow and even, I would say, uh, start a dialogue with some of the people. It doesn't mean that when you start a dialogue, you undercut Abu Mazen. There's a way of doing it, but you have to get to know these people, to start to talk to them. It doesn't make sense that, uh, you know, uh, you will talk to them for the first time after Abu Mazen steps down. You have to uh, start uh, and uh, lay the ground for this today. I'm talking only about a dialogue. I'm not talking about any of us taking a position who should succeed uh, Abu Mazen. That's a dangerous game and a slippery uh, slope. But it's about time decision makers thought about it and, and uh, you know, started uh, some kind of a dialogue with some of the figures uh, involved. Second, I think uh, that when people talk about uh, the application of Israeli sovereignty in the West Bank, 
the consideration of how the, this might impact a future Palestinian leadership should be also part of the discussion. I'm not suggesting that this is a number one consideration, but it is a consideration, and people have to uh, you know, factor this in uh, as well. And finally, given where we are in the so-called peace process, uh, the, there's no process and uh, there's growing despair in a two-state solution, the two societies, when you have a new Palestinian leadership, obviously that leadership will have to think about a Palestinian strategy, and there are a variety of strategies they could choose uh, from. Uh, negotiations, uh, uh, armed struggle, popular struggle, uh, reconciliation with Hamas, uh, one state, you name it. But uh, those looking at the Palestinian leadership from the outside, I'm talking here about especially Israel, the United States and others, should uh, start thinking about a different paradigm and not just uh, uh, continue with this, uh, the same mantra and knee-jerk knee reaction of calling on the parties to sit down and negotiate. Uh, you don't put that burden on a new leadership. They are unable to cope with it. And uh, it's time to think about different paradigms in dealing with this conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, right, I'll start with the first question, and then uh, I urge any of our listeners who want to uh, ask questions to our guests that they uh, send their question by email to policyforum at washingtoninstitute, one word, dot org. All right, first question. I, I want to pick up on some of the things that were said and not said. Um, you, know, you know, I would like to start, you know, I'm going to ask one for each of you. Rafe, we didn't hear a lot about the younger generation's views. Uh, if they have, you know, a view about succession, are they important at all? We know that Jabril Rajoub has been the head of the Palestinian Soccer Association or Palestine, Palestine Football Association, as you call it. Um, but to what extent are younger people engaged or is this like a generation removed and is it important? Uh, could they at all say, we don't like these choices? We, we didn't hear about Marwan Barghouti also, who we used to see him as a charismatic figure. Or is he out of the picture because he's in prison? So if you could deal with um, the generational piece and, and, and the Barghouti angle. And to Ehud, what was so, it was fascinating uh, to hear about the groupings and what you said certainly rings true to what I pick up as well. Uh, I'm just, what's also interesting sometimes is it doesn't seem to be a, a groupings based on ideology or policy differences. And I wonder if you could elucidate a little of that, or is it? Or, you know, is the wing of uh, Majid Faraj and Hussein al-Sheikh for closer uh, security ties with Israel? Uh, it doesn't seem that ideology is, function, is factoring into succession. And I think for our viewers here, that, that in itself is, is really important, or policy differences regarding to Gaza. So the, the role or lack of role of ideology and policy between these two groupings. And for Mike, what's also striking is, I didn't hear on the panel, the belief that, um, you know, that, that external forces would help shape succession. You know, in, in Palestinian politics, often the Muammar, the conspiracy theory, plays heavily, but none of you thought that the, you know, maybe yes, Dahlan is living in Abu Dhabi, but no one thought the Emirates was trying to guide succession. And Israel, Mike, is, you know, your specialty also, the fact that has Israel learned a lesson from 1982 in Lebanon, where it's, the lesson is it's very hard to engineer, uh, you know, the, the politics of an Arab country, especially if you're a Jewish state. So how much is the humility of external factors like Israel and the Arab world, uh, you know, important here to understand that maybe they're not such a huge factor, that it's more the internal dynamics within the Palestinian polity that will be the more dominant factor. So Raith, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, thank you, David. Um, I mean, with the young generation, in general, young Palestinians today uh, in the West Bank uh, are maybe checked out of politics. If you look at the public opinion polls, 
you ask young, especially younger Palestinians, this is an overall phenomenon, but uh, more pronounced in the younger uh, folks, is uh, they don't trust any of their leaderships, neither Hamas nor Fatah. Um, public opinion polls uh, show you that a majority of Palestinians look at the Palestinian Authority as a liability, not uh, an asset to the Palestinian people. You have a generation that has been basically pushed out of the political process. I mean, one thing um, that uh, used to traditionally be uh, the case with Fatah in particular, Fatah was the political home for most uh, politically active young Palestinians. And this has changed. And today, Fatah has uh, come more to resemble the Ba'ath Party or the, even the Communist Party in the former Soviet Union, not in terms of the bloodiness, but in terms of being too uh, associated in public perception with government. You join Fatah to give a, get a government job. You don't join Fatah because you are politically um, active or energetic uh, or motivated. So you have a large number of Palestinian uh, youth who are out of the, out of the picture, um, are not interested. This explains some of the things that were mentioned by my colleagues. Uh, why you don't see that many people coming to demonstrations? Why you see the PA struggling and having to bus uh, its, uh, its employees to these kind of uh, public uh, events? So the public is uh, largely, the young are largely checked out. They've given up on the idea of two-state solution. You see the majority thinking not only that it's uh, um, unachievable, many are thinking that it's uh, not even desirable. So we're seeing this particular shift. Now, this is not something to be comfortable, to give you a lot, to give one comfort, comfort in the sense that uh, this apathy could very quickly uh, turn into rage, anger, etc. Not in the traditional sense of seeing organized resistance, but uh, this is basically the kind of ground for a repetition of what we saw a few years ago of the knife intifada, you know, a political vacuum that produces more individually motivated uh, lone wolf kind of uh, instability. So to my mind, this is not a factor today in the decision making, but uh, this uh, removes one of the anchors that the system needs to create stability. And this is more you know, linked to the, uh, uh, somehow to the Marwan Barghouti uh, question. In the case of uh, Marwan, first of all, there was a very intentional uh, strategy to push him and his supporters out of Fatah. If you look at the results of the seventh Fatah conference, that's the last major Fatah meeting, it is striking for a leader who has such popularity to see how few of his uh, supporters, people who are seen as his wing, have basically been pushed out. In the Fatah Central Committee today, there is no one who can be affili said, affiliated directly with uh, Marwan. Now, uh, as a result of this, of course, uh, a lot of his uh, supporters have checked out of the political process, are not uh, particularly active in the, in the formal decision-making and political uh, uh, deliberations. If you look at uh, how Marwan stands with the Fatah Central Committee members, every member of the Fatah Central Committee would want to get uh, Barghouti's uh, support. They will court him, they will court his wife, they will court his son. Uh, everyone wants to have his picture on their uh, campaign uh, uh, posters or whatnot. No one would want to uh, give Marwan a leadership position. Uh, he's too unpredictable, he's too popular. So what you will see is an attempt to co-opt Marwan. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think a policy, a continuation of the current policy, no matter who is a successful uh, uh, contender, to keep Marwan and his uh, 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 base out of the political uh, picture. Good. Okay, Ehud, over to you. The, when you talk about the two groupings, it's striking how we don't see it's based on differences of ideology, but it's based more on power. It doesn't seem to be based on policy differences, or is that not accurate? Two quick points. One is we have to realize that people in the West Bank, not every single one, mostly despise the PA, feel that this is a corrupt organization, impotent politically and in terms of provision uh, of services, uh, they have very little respect. And now, these days now, they feel that the PA uh, is uh, uh, trying to put the burden on the population. That is, by announcing that they cut contacts with the Israeli authorities. Now, if I'm a Palestinian in the West Bank, 
and I need to get treated in an Israeli hospital, or I want to go to the beach, or I need a work permit, whatever. I need to apply myself directly to the Israelis. So people feel neglected. At the same time, I'm not going to get my full salary. I'm lucky if the PA pays me half my salary. And we are speaking here of, I don't know, 150,000 uh, uh, government employees. That's the sense in which everybody should keep in mind when we talk West Bank. Now, what you have amongst the, the groupings of candidates and aspirants in Fatah for the succession. And as Rait mentioned uh, uh, rightly, uh, the posturing tends to be uh, more critical of Israel. I have, uh, I'm more uh, anti-Israel. I don't like the security cooperation. I would like to suspend it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this posturing does not amount to real policy difference or to real ideological differences. And if I may, one last point, which is more general. We are witnessing all over us, forget now about the Palestinians, we are witnessing a meltdown of much of the Arab world. We are witnessing a decline of political Arabism. The age of ideology in the Arab world is over. It's over in Palestine too. It's the age of pragmatism. And I think what you see amongst the different contenders is the attempt to present themselves as being more pra pragmatic and more able to deliver rather than saying we have a different worldview. Okay, so that just means like for a lot of our viewers, and I got a question like this, you know, people want to know, look, there's going to be rejectionism against Israel even after succession, or maybe it's heightened during succession to influence succession. So people want to know, how, how will they treat Hamas? Are there differences in the way, Ehud, do you think that they will treat Hamas? And I'm going to ask that to Mike too. I don't think Hamas is very popular in the West Bank. To the extent that they are popular, it's a reaction of people being disappointed with the performance of the PA, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's over. Basically, we are not going into this now, I know, but I just have to mention, I don't know, and I've spent all my life in this, I don't know Palestinians who really crave this statelet that is offered to them by the two-state solution. I don't know them. And I can tell you because I spend time with them and talk to them all the time. I don't know anybody in the current Fatah Central Committee, Palestinian leadership, who really craves the two-state uh, solution for the compromise that they have in order to make it possible. So that's the mood. It's very discouraging, and we don't have time to that now, but the, 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 the uh, conclusion is that, is that Israel has to do something which it is not doing. Okay, over to you, Mike, uh, which is the role or the lack of role of external actors. And as someone who's been in the Israeli defense establishment for decades, to what extent do you think Israel's history is shaping its approach today? Which is, if we try to push something through, it'll backlash, it'll boomerang against us. We've learned this from 1982. How much is Israel's past shaping the way uh, it thinks now? And also the point that A and I were discussing, does succession lead to more rejectionism or less rejectionism uh, as a reaction as well? So those two separate points. Uh, okay, let, let me first, uh, before I answer these questions, uh, make a brief reference to Marwan Balguti. Um, I can tell you that uh, the Israeli defense establishment is not in favor of releasing him from jail in order for him uh, to run for leadership. 
because uh, people think that uh, he means a lot of uh, trouble. In the past, uh, he was like Arafat, supportive of uh, simultaneous uh, diplomacy and violence. And, uh, and in any case, you hear from everybody that even if he's out of jail, then uh, you know, his, his image is because he's in jail, but once so he's out of jail, all the air will go out of the balloon. But I can tell you that, as was mentioned by Wraith, uh, from talking to Fatah people, there's no uh, enthusiasm about uh, him uh, entering the race. Uh, the race, and as one uh, uh, senior Fatah member told me uh, over a year ago, he said, "We need a leader that will liberate us, not one that we have to liberate him." So uh, that's about uh, Barghouti. But now let me turn to your questions about the external intervention. I do not see any appetite, and I've been talking to people here in our defense establishment and some decision makers. I don't see any appetite for Israel to intervene in that. It may be that, uh, you know, some of our past history uh, left a mark, like uh, Israel trying to intervene and crown someone in Lebanon in the early 80s, maybe. I think part of it was also that. Uh, Abu Mazen, in some ways, with all the big criticism on him, in some ways was convenient for, uh, for uh, the Israeli government. Uh, so people didn't want to start uh, talking to others who might uh, undermine him and left it as it is. But again, I don't see any appetite by anybody here to try and design a policy of uh, crowning something uh, post Abu Mazen. There is interest in talking to people, but not in, you know, uh, trying to push someone uh, forward. I do think, by the way, that uh, uh, if someone is uh, crowned by them, it'll be very interesting uh, to start talking to him. And I think any would-be uh, successor uh, would like also to have some open channels uh, with Israel, notwithstanding the conflict itself and all the differences and also uh, they need it for uh, practical purposes to survive for as long as the PA is is there and doesn't dismantle itself. I do think, by the way, that the Arabs are important in uh, uh, helping uh, make some of the uh, coalitions we discussed earlier. For example, to mend fences between uh, Dahlan and uh, Rajub, uh, the Arabs could play a role here, I think. Again, it's not them engineering a future leadership, but uh, they could help some, uh, some of the coalitions. I, in terms of uh, policy towards Hamas, uh, I, as far as I am aware, I definitely people like Dahlan or people like Fayyad, they have thought about uh, you know, ways to uh, mend fences with Hamas or start a different dialogue with Hamas. Dahlan, uh, has a personal relationship with Yehi Sinwar. He knows him from his childhood in Gaza. He spent time with him. Uh, Fayyad uh, issued the paper about this. I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of any thinking on the other side. Uh, people like Majid Faraj and Hussein Sheikh, I think, reflect the thinking of Abu Mazen that doesn't want to play any role in Gaza. In fact, he wants to cut more and more of the funding to Gaza. So, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that uh, a coalition, let's say, of uh, Dahlan or Jub and others would succeed in mending fences uh, with Gaza because uh, there, are, there are major, major uh, obstacles there. Okay, uh, back to you, Wraith, uh, here in Washington. Could you, you know, we, you, somebody mentioned Salam Fayyad and uh, it may have been each of you in certain ways. To what extent, Wraith, do you think that the, the, the leadership, whatever it is, is aware of maybe where it's, you know, where it's, what is not a strong suit? Fayyad was, received very high marks among the Palestinians themselves in the polls of Khalil Shakaki for, for his, uh, you know, services-oriented approach as prime minister. And... Uh, I've, I've had certain Palestinians privately say things to me, we want him back. I always worry that they say that to me uh, because I'm coming from the United States. But do you, to what extent is he like a, a key number two to no matter who emerges as number one because of the technocratic performance? 
and because of his international name that could help uh, the Palestinian Authority. So how do you see where the shifting sands impacting him as a, as a, as a prime minister in terms of who emerges on top, right? It is very difficult to uh, predict this. I mean, one thing that I think uh, uh, the three of us mentioned is how um, ephemeral the Palestinian coalitions are. Uh, but I think Ehud mentioned the uh, uh, Italian mafia thing. Coalitions change all the time. But traditionally, uh, at least one of the two groupings that uh, Ehud and uh, Mike mentioned has, good, has reasonable relations with uh, Fayyad. And they do understand, for the reasons that you mentioned, uh, David, that uh, you will need someone who can deliver. Um, you need someone who will have quick access to the international community, and none of them have that kind of uh, cachet. And if we move to a situation uh, that I think Mike hinted at, where we move away from high diplomacy and start focusing on more practical uh, steps as an approach to a peace process, uh, Fayyad's uh, performance was uh, fantastic. Um, some of the uh, uh, aspirants have a bad history with him. You know, uh, Faraj and uh, Sheikh were part of his ouster. So I can't see this uh, moving. Uh, Shteye sees him as a competitor. Shteye is trying to present himself as the kind of technically capable, internationally palatable uh, leader. So a lot will change. And Fayyad actually does represent a bit of a risk a threat to them. While he had tense relations with the Fatah leadership, and many of them, as I mentioned, were part of uh, pushing him out of power, Anecdotally, at least, many of the younger members of uh, Fatah who want to see a different, more capable, cleaner Fatah see him and look at him particularly now with a degree of nostalgia. So he is one of the actors, and it's really hard to uh, figure out now how uh, he will fare um, just because of these kind of considerations. But no matter who will come next, we'll need someone with that kind of uh, profile. Okay. Ehud, let me ask you, this a question comes from someone we all know, Professor uh, Chuck Freilich, who's at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. And he asks about the, um, the issue of transitions in terms of how bloody, Ehud, uh, you know, the, the theory of the three hats, if we call it, you know, PA, PLO, and FATA, I think was mentioned here. Uh, and we saw this in, in the Zionist movement too that groups that are important in a pre-state period, ultimately the state is what is important once 48. There was a World Zionist organization that David Ben-Gurion headed, the Jewish agency in the pre-48 period, but ultimately once you have a state, you have the resources, the money, and you have the arms, you've got the, the apparatus of the state at your disposal, that's clearly the most important institution is the state itself. So to what extent, how stable is the three hat scenario and versus is the nature of transitions as Chuck suggests, do they, does it get bloody? Do you expect this to be a bloody transition or do you expect the equilibrium of the different power centers that you listed as being more stable and uh, that could go on for quite a while? Um. We differ, David, because I don't see a three-hat uh, uh, coalition uh, stepping in for Abbas. What I see is a six or eight hats uh, coalition. They have many jobs that they can uh, distribute between several people, and this guy will be prime minister, and this guy will be head of the PLO and chairman of Fatah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That, that it doesn't take too much ingenuity. I agree with Chuck, this is not going to last very long. But initially, that could be the, the entry point uh, uh, to an uh, uh, arrangement. I'll make one other point, unsolicited, very briefly. You know, if I was told an hour from now that people tried to storm the Mukata, the headquarters in Ramallah, and take over, it won't knock me off my feet. This is the situation. Okay. All right. Mike, you know, we, and I'll, I'll ask this to all the panelists actually, but you know, here we are on the eve of annexation, which, which looks like it's gonna be put off 
um, for, for a variety of reasons. We're not here to talk about that as much, but you know, it's hard to have this discussion without mentioning the annexation dimension. But people have talked about the PA's collapse, and Ehud has spoken really um, vividly about you know how how precarious it is. Uh, you know, you, there's always that one school of thought that says, listen, they get 150,000 salaries. You don't give that up so quickly. Uh, Abbas in 2014, uh, you know, kept saying, I'm going to turn over the keys to the corporal um, at the Israeli crossing points and say, you're in charge. And yet, as soon as he said that publicly, it's not just privately, there were four Palestinian Authority denials of their own leader within a 24 hour period. I remember this. So, you know, there's one theory that says, you know, it, it, it might look precarious, but it's more durable because people have a stake in stability and in a salary. And there are those who say, listen, you can't really plan this. Uh, it, it, you know, th there are days people just won't show up for work on, on the security services if they feel there's no future here. So I guess I'm trying to understand what does collapse look like? How do we define collapse? And how likely is it in the connection of, of annexation? Does it matter which sort of annexation? Or even without annexation, how, how durable is, is the PA given your experience in the Israeli uh, security world? Uh, this is a very good uh, question. It's a very important question. And it's uh, one of the main major bones of contention in the debate over whether or not Israel should apply sovereignty or not do it. Um, people who uh, support the move will tell you that uh, because the Palestinians have a very deep self-interest in maintaining this political entity for a variety of reasons, uh, it will not collapse. Uh, somehow it will keep moving and uh, others will breathe life into it and, uh, and even Israel itself at moments of truth injected money to the Palestinian Authority to prevent its collapse and so on. Uh, and those who oppose the move will tell you that you cannot take it for granted that this entity will uh, survive forever. Uh, I think the, the main thinking uh, within our defense establishment is that you cannot, it cannot be guaranteed that uh, with all the challenges, you know, piling up on this entity, that it will continue to function and survive as it is forever. The concern is not so much that the Palestinian leadership will decide to dismantle itself. That's much less likely. And here, uh, I echo what Ehud said, they're not going to just hand over the keys. Uh, they have their own uh, interests and uh, that's unlikely. But the scenario that uh, people think about and I am also concerned about in following uh, what's happening there on the ground is that uh, this weak entity will become incapacitated. Will, will it may collapse economically. It will maybe uh, unable uh, to, to continuously pay salaries and function on the ground and control security. And if you don't pay salaries to your uh, security personnel, they will not turn up to work. Some can buy them. They can join up hands with uh, uh, armed Tanzim, ele Tanzim elements on the ground. Uh, there are many matches on the ground that can ignite the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, a weak uh, structure that even without a, a, a decision from the top to dismantle it, may just stop functioning and become incapacitated. And if that happens, Israel will have to step in more and more, assume more responsibilities. And uh, I think that's one of the main concerns uh, in our defense establishment. I share that concern. I don't think we should uh, take it for granted that uh, what we have today will be there forever, no matter what we do. Okay, and <laughs> this is the final round too. So I, I wanna get these questions to uh, Rafe and Ehud, uh, which is Rafe, can you just say, how would you think about the issue of collapse and wh what would it look like, how likely? And of course you could say, well, if there was a, a breakthrough on the peace process front that would bolster them, what else would bolster the Palestinian Authority 
as there's something that an external actor could do to, to strengthen it right. in your view, or it's, uh, it's all based on an internal dynamic. Right. I mean, look, uh, I, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Mike and Uhud in that there will be no decision to dismantle the PA. Dismantling the PA for the current leadership will not only be, you know, uh, it will be the end of their political project. I cannot see the PLO, or for that matter, Fatah, continuing to survive much beyond the, the PA. Arafat and that generation put their, all of their bets in the PA, and they have a stake in maintaining it. However, I also share uh, uh, what uh, Mike described. The PA today is an extremely weak entity. At the very, very fundamental foundation of this weakness, it's political. It's political because the PA was created in the Palestinian public perception, at least, as a transitional step towards uh, independence, creating a Palestinian state. Yes, a two-state solution, no one craved it, but I think a majority had uh, resigned themselves. That's the best uh, achievable uh, objective. Even that has failed. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you add the economic, you add the corruption, you add uh, the lack of democracy and all of these things, and you end up with a very, very weak uh, institution. Now, strong institutions can absorb shocks. We saw this, uh, for example, when Arafat died. The PA was still strong enough to absorb that kind of shock. Weak institutions, we just don't know. And they could be uh, toppled and the whole edifice can uh, collapse uh, when there is a shock. And there are many shocks. One of my own concerns about, one of my main concerns about uh, succession is that this is the kind of shock that a strong institution can manage, but a weak institution might not be able uh, to manage. Annexation is another uh, potential uh, trigger. I share the view that it will not necessarily produce violence, but I can't guarantee it 100% because there is this kind of uh, weakness. Uh, so to my mind, uh, when you talk about collapse, uh, the, inc the, the possibility increases. And uh, it could well be uh, what Ehud mentioned, demonstrations against the PA itself because of economics, corruption, no Arab Spring uh, style. It could be demonstrations against Israel that will turn against uh, the PA. And there is no way that we can predict. And I think this is kind of the dilemma for a lot of the uh, uh, policy and security uh, planners, uh, whether the PA or uh, uh, in Israel itself. Now, what can the externals uh, do to survive, support that? First of all, peace breakthrough, impossible. Not only because of Palestinian uh, rejectionism, that is a factor. Yet uh, also Israel, at least the current Israeli government, uh, let's say its view of peace simply does not fit with even the most minimalist Palestinian view of peace. This is not possible uh, to have peace right now. And instead, we need to have more concrete stabilizing uh, uh, steps that will create a sense of forward momentum. These could be coordinated unilateral small steps. This could be economic. This could be security, extending PA jurisdiction beyond the existing areas. But you have to create, because today, the view among the Palestinians is the trajectory is going negative. We have to create a shift in this trajectory, and this shift will not happen through a breakthrough in high diplomacy. It will have to happen through concrete steps that the Palestinians themselves feel, first of all, impact them personally, but also can be framed as a, a reversal, of course, towards rebuilding, the, uh, reigniting the possibility of a Palestinian state sometime in the future. All right, Ayud, I'm going to give you the last word here on this, which is if people wanted to strengthen the PA, and, you know, as, as I said to Raith, I, I don't believe a breakthrough uh, on the peace process is in the cards in any uh, big way. I don't think anyone believes that. What could be done by Jordan, uh, other external Arab actors? It's just so fascinating. Our listeners don't always recall this, but Israel has had a million ways if it wanted to demolish the PA. And let it, this has been led during the period of Netanyahu, ironically, but it has felt that it's, it's good for Israel that there is a PA. So I'm asking you, like, you know, what... You know, you, you made your views known on the collapse issue, but what could be done to bolster uh, the PA that's realistic by other actors? Or do you think outsiders really have no, no impact and it's an internal Palestinian dynamic? Yeah, uh, David, I think that the problem of the PA is that it has lost its way. It, it's un, it, they are unable to chart a new course they cannot uh, present uh, achievable goals, objectives to their constituency, etc. And they are losing backing. First of all, backing of the Arab world. Nobody, certainly not Jordan, 
nobody is really supporting the Palestinian Authority uh, in the Arab world. And I believe that the only way to um, uh, change the uh, uh, trajectory is if the US, this administration, next administration, the donor states, EU, Norway, Japan, etc., and Israel, maybe a new Israeli government sometime next year, if they will set a more mod modest objective in the form of, I'll use the bad word interim, in the form of some sort of an interim, intermediate arrangement between, with a territorial component, economic component, political component, etc., between between Israel and the PA. Because I do believe that if the donor states and it takes American backing to do that. If the donor states come to Abbas who, or whoever succeeds him and tell him we had enough is enough, either we start moving to change the lay of the land or we are cutting our subsidies, I think the Palestinians will move. Then we have a little problem. We need an Israeli government which will be willing to move too, but I have no control over that. Okay. On that note, I would like to thank our three panelists, uh, Rachel Omari, Ehud Yari, Mike Herzog, for a very fascinating conversation uh, on succession. I'm sure we will be discussing this some more. We'll see how the annexation issue plays out, uh, in if, whether it's tomorrow or the weeks and months ahead. I urge all our viewers to keep tuned in to the Washington Institute, whether it's Facebook Live or going to our website, www.washingtoninstitute.org. I urge you all to stay safe and good health and good spirits to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye, everyone.